Next up, I'd like to invite Andrew Black of Certified Kind to the stage. All right. Hey, can you hear me? All right. So uh, before I get started, I just wanted to thank uh, Erica Winters from Constant Gardener and Bethany Sherman from OG Analytical for putting this event on every month. Right. And so, yes, my name's Andrew Black, and I'm with Certified Kind. And I'm going to advance the slide here. There we go. And so Certified Kind is a cannabis certification program designed for organic processors and organic growers. And um, so, but before I get started, you know, I want to tell you a little story. I, uh, you know, I don't get out in front of all people and speak on stage that often. I love it when I do. But, you know, last night I was a little nervous, so I thought I'd go down to the store and uh, pick up something to calm my nerves. Um, and so I went to this store, and I'm pretty sure it wasn't licensed with the OLLC or OHA, and I picked up some really green buds, uh, some big buds, um, tight, dense flower structure. Well, you got to see it. You got to see it. Hold on. I brought some here, and it's just so green. You got to see it. Check it out. And for those of you in the back who didn't bring your glasses, uh, this is actually a head of broccoli. But anyway, why am I up on stage at the Eugene Cannabis Science Pub holding a head of broccoli? Well, today in my talk, I want to um, explain a little bit about certifi certified kind and our certification process, and also explain to you why certification is relevant and meaningful for cannabis. So I'm gonna advance the slide here in a minute. But first of all, what I wanna tell you about broccoli. Okay, what if I were to tell you that 29% of broccoli out there is contaminated with pesticides? What if I were to tell you that 73%, 73% of all fruits and vegetables tested by the USDA in 2014 were contaminated with one or more pesticide. Well, folks, um, it's, sadly, I'm not making this stuff up. Um, this data comes from the USDA's own data in their pesticide data uh, program, and it's from 2014. And in fact, 29% of broccoli tested positive for pesticide residue in their study. And 73% of uh, Fresh fruits and vegetables test positive for pesticide residue. And I bring that up because the question is, do you want to eat that broccoli? Do you want to, do you want to grow that broccoli? Do you want to sell that broccoli? Okay. Well, what about cannabis? You know? um, so I know everyone here probably is, a, is an enthusiast of organic agriculture, regenerative agriculture, um, living soils, etc. So, but what I want to also do is tell you a story, more stories. Colorado, let's start with Colorado. Is pesticide residue a problem with cannabis? Let's start with Colorado, the first state to uh, um, legalize adult use recreational cannabis. In just recently, well, first of all, 36 cannabis recalls since September of 2015. What happened? Well, uh, they found uh, pesticide residues on cannabis in, on Denver flower and concentrates, and they've been issuing public health advisories in Denver, and there's been 36 since September. That's just eight months. The last one uh, the, of note for me was March 23rd. Uh, they issued a public health advisory for cannabis that was grown by Fireside Organics. It tested positive for mycobutanol and piperonal butoxide. Now, I have a problem with that because the, the company is representing themselves as organics. Organic, right? Fireside organic, but they used mycobutanol and they got caught. So what about Washington? Washington was the second state to legalize. And a similar story is unfolding in Washington. In February of this year, the state of Washington investigated two complaints. Um, of facilities that were allegedly using prohibited pesticides. And when I say prohibited pesticides, I mean pesticides that aren't allowed in organic agriculture, aren't allowed in certified kind agriculture, or clean green, or dragonfly earth medicine. 
These are pesticides that are toxins, endocrine disruptors, carcinogens. Um, these are pesticides that are used in conventional agriculture, but aren't allowed in cannabis. And so, also in Washington, oh, those two, those two facilities that were tested, that uh, they went and investigated and found bottles of pesticides, they were fined $2,500 each. Is that enough? Is that too much? So in March of 2015, Seattle's Independent Weekly, The Stranger, reported on some uh, independent pesticide residue testing that was performed by a, an organization called the Clean Cannabis Association. And what they found was that three out of 10 flower samples that they tested came back positive for pesticide residues that aren't allowed in organic agriculture and aren't supposed to be in cannabis in Washington. They found that 23 out of 27 concentrates that they tested had pesticide residue on them that's not supposed to be there. In fact, one of the dirtiest samples had more than six pesticide residues in it. And another one of the dirty samples had levels of microbutanol at 200 parts per million. Now, to get a sense of how high that is, consider that the EPA has established a tolerance for microbutanol on a grape at one part per million. So this concentrate, and it was an RSO, had 200 parts per million. So yes, we have a little bit of a pesticide issue in cannabis. Um, and what about Oregon? So here's actually the pesticide testing result from one of those tests up in Washington. I'm not making this stuff up. <laughs> okay, what about in Oregon? Well, Oregon's a unique situation because we've had mandatory pesticide residue testing on medical cannabis for the last couple of years. And now we're moving into a situation where we have proposed uh, administrative rules that are going to require batch testing of uh, cured dried flour for pesticide residues for uh, adult use recreational. Um, and they're going to test for 59 different pesticides. I'll get back to that in a second. But in Oregon last year, many of you probably remember, the Oregonian did a special report, an investigation of cannabis products in Portland, and they pulled 10 concentrates off the shelf, and eight out of 10 had pesticide residues in them. So in Oregon, I think it's, I think it's safe to say, and, I, and I've talked to some of the labs in the state, that a lot of the cannabis um, flower and concentrates are coming back positive for pesticide residue. But, you know, just as with, uh, Broccoli, if you buy organic broccoli, you're, you're reducing your, your exposure to those uh, toxic pesticides. And the same thing is true if you're buying a, a certified cannabis. Those types of pesticides aren't allowed in organic agriculture. And we do our best to make sure that growers don't use them. So that's the list. You can't see it, so I'm going to buzz through it. And I put this slide in here to also remember to talk about one of the main tenets of organic agriculture is that you build organic, so you build soil. So at Certified Kind, we want to work with growers that are passionate about building their soils, that are passionate about living soil and using practices like compost production on farm. This is a picture, this is a giant row of compost production. I love that picture. Um, So again, uh, organic growers have a lot of tools to use besides chemical fertilizers. And chemical salt, salt fertilizers, uh, they're really easy to use in that the plant responds really well to them, but it's force-feeding nutrients. Sustainable farmers, sustainable agriculture use things like cover cropping, and this is a big field of vetch, fava, rye. And one of my favorite um, uh, cover crops is crimson clover. It's a small seeded uh, crop. It's a legume, it fixes 50 to 150 pounds of nitrogen um, in the spring when your plants need it. So I encourage everyone to experiment with it because it's really easy to use. And so this, this, this slide here is to remind you about my experience, okay? So I didn't really introduce myself very well, but I've been doing organic certification since 2005 with Oregon Tilth. Uh, in fact, I was the first uh, full-time organic inspector at Oregon till um, back in 2005. When we first started in 2005, Oregon Tilth had about 800 
800 clients that they certified, and now it's almost up to 1,600. So there's been a dramatic growth in the organic food industry in the last 10 years. Uh, it's up to a $35 billion industry. And so, so what does this do for the emerging cannabis market? Well, I think um, consumers are educated about what certification means, and they, they kind of look for certified product, or at least they recognize it in the marketplace. And so certification for a cannabis company can help with branding. It can help you tell a story about your product, about your farm, that's hard to communicate. It's really hard to communicate to somebody all the sustainable farming practices that you put out there, whether it be um, fermented tea extracts, compost teas, you know, whatever you're doing to enrich the soil microbial life. Those things are kind of hard to explain, and so a certification can help with that. And again, Oregon Tilth is a completely separate company than Certified Kind. Um, it's really important that I get up here on stage and say that because, as Kathy Ging was talking about, Oregon Tilth can't touch cannabis. They can't even, they can't even really talk about it too much because of the fear of losing their federal accreditation with the, the USDA. And that's just the state of affairs right now. So the certif certification cycle. How do you go about getting a certification for your farm or your processing facility? Well, the first step is to fill out an application. The application doubles as your certified kind system plan or your organic management plan. And in that plan, you tell us information about your farm. It leads you through a series of questions that start getting you thinking about your sustainability practices and or on a farm or how you're producing a pure product if you're a processor. The next step is an initial review. So we, we do a very thorough upfront initial review of that application just to determine if you're eligible. I'll tell you why. One of the first, one of the first people that we inspected for certified kind didn't want to fill out an application. And so we made the mistake going down to that farm and saying, okay, well, you can fill out the application during the inspection. That, that turned out to be uh, a poor choice because uh, that, that farm had been using some pH adjusters. Synthetic pH adjusters aren't allowed. Liquid fertilizers. Liquid fertilizers are a, a real uh, uh, Achilles heel for cannabis growers that are trying to go the organic route because a lot of times liquid fertilizers have stabilizers or preservatives that are not listed on the label and will disqualify you from organic certification or certified kind. So you got to be very careful what you use. Anyway, we went out, we, we went out there, inspected uh, the farm, got down to the exit interview, which is you know, where you talk about the observations and findings of the inspection, and it was one of those moments where you know, you're like, uh, okay, well, and sort of broke the news that it looks like you won't, you won't, you won't be able to get your certification. You know, the final decision is not in my hands as the inspector. We have qualified reviewers to review the inspection report and the organic system plan together to make the decision. But indeed, that was the case. So we do have a program, though, for people like that. If you can prove that your land is free of prohibited materials for at least 12 months, we have a transitional program, which is... Um, modeled after Oregon Tilt's old transitional program. And so that way we can include people who are also trying their hardest to get into uh, organic agriculture, but they need a little bit more time to learn. So that gives them a way to express their commitment to sustainability. And we should also su support transitional produce or transitional cannabis when we can. So. We do the on annual on-site inspection. So the inspection happens every year. At our inspections in Oregon, we take tissue samples. So we take uh, leaf tissue samples and send them to labs like OG Analytical, which is an awesome lab right here in Eugene, Oregon. <laughs> we use um, Pacific Agricultural Lab too, which is a produce lab that we have contacts with that will actually test the leaf of uh, cannabis, even though they're not a, uh, cannabis is not their specialty, but they, but they have a great um, reputation as a quality lab. We've also used Kenevere labs down in Southern Oregon. Um, so at the uh, annual on-site inspection, uh, it's very thorough. You can expect it to last three to five hours, depending on the complexity of your, of your location, what you're doing. Uh, we'll ask you detailed questions about what fertilizer you, 
what fertilizers you're using, what pest control materials you're using, what soil mediums you're using. Um, and we try and verify that you're keeping adequate records to demonstrate compliance to the rules, etc. So after the inspection, a final reviewer reviews the inspection report and makes the certification decision. If there are issues of concern that you need to deal with prior to getting the certification and they're minor and can be corrected, We'll give you 21 days to come up with a response and correct those deficiencies. Sometimes certain things, like I had mentioned before, use of chemical fertilizer or pH up adjuster, uh, pH down with uh, synthetic um, chemicals in there, will disqualify you. And, and then we'll have to have a real serious conversation about how to move forward or not. So once certification is granted, You've achieved certified kind status. You have to maintain that certification over the year. So that means if you decide to add dragonfly earth medicine to uh, your fertility lineup, you need to inform us of that so that we can determine if that fertility material or pest control material is compliant to the certified kind standard. Okay. And just so you know, the certified kind standard is a mashup of the USDA organic standard and the EU organic standard, and it's and it's. It's accessible, it's on our website, it's, you can read it. We're trying to be fully transparent here of what our certification program's all about. So, I think I hit the highlights that I wanted to hit. Um, certified Kind specializes in certification of organically grown cannabis and organically produced products. So we do certified critical source here in town, a CO2 extractor, and um, really excited about that. We were founded in 2014, and we certify farms in California, Oregon, Washington, and Colorado. There's also two areas where I think we go beyond organic, and that is also with social justice and energy consumption in indoor farms. We have um, developed rules for social justice that are based off IFOM rules. IFOM is the International Federation of Organic Movements. and um, so those rules on social justice and basic worker rights are in our standard, and it also requires fair treatment of labor, and also that they have a right to collectively bargain, which might not seem too relevant right now in the nation, nascent stages of the cannabis uh, industry, but 10 years from now, I think collective bargaining for workers is going to be an issue, and we ought to preserve that right with our certification. So. Another thing, the team that we put together uh, for our certification, for our inspectors and our certification staff, they are uh, experts in their field. They have received advanced training from the USDA National Organic Program, outside trainings from OMRI, the Washington State Department of Agriculture's Organic Program, and also CCOF, uh, which is the California Certified Organic Farmers, and Oregon Till, of course. Um, Certified Kind is a, a, it's a side part-time project for me right now. I also work um, half-time for Oregon Tilth as a certification officer. And so I hope that um, if you're a grower or a process, if you're a grower out there and you're passionate about sustainable agriculture, that you come talk to me and, and we, we discuss if certification is the right choice for you. If you're a processor and you're committed to purity, and putting out a pure product and supporting your sustainable farmer brothers and sisters, come talk to me. So that's all I got. Thank you. We'll open up the floor to questions at this point. All right. How does your certification process differ from Clean Green and Josh and Kelly? I forgot the name of it. Well, it's just Dragonfly Pure. Okay. And the, and the um, Dimitri? Demeter. So the question was, how does Certified Kind differ from Clean Green Certified Dragonfly Earth Medicine Pure and Demeter, which is a biodynamic standard? Well should start out by saying the biodynamic standard is a bit different than what we're doing here. Biodynamic 
involves the use of uh, biodynamic preparations. And also, similar to Dragonfly Earth Medicine Standard, I think there's a restriction on how, on what type of inputs you can use as far as the distance where they come from. So I actually um, have taken in a course from Jim Fulmer in uh, biodynamic because um, he was looking for biodynamic inspectors at one point. Um, so I can tell you that the certified kind standard is more like USDA organic than it is like biodynamic. Um, as far as dragonfly earth medicine goes, um, if I think we're going to hear more about that and it'll become apparent what the differences are. Uh, and I think of bi and I think my reading of dragonfly earth medicine is that it goes beyond organic in a way that certified kind doesn't. So, um, and also it might be a harder to get the dragonfly earth medicine pure uh, certification than it would be clean green or certified kind or USDA organic. So that's my, that's my honest uh, answer on that. Now the difference between clean green and certified kind, I think those two programs are very similar. Uh, both Chris Van Hook and I have similar backgrounds working with USDA organic certifiers and I think that over time we'll figure out what those differences are. Good question, Lizzie. Well, I've got one for you, Andrew. I'm curious where 25B compliant pesticide products fall in the matrix as far as what's allowable. So 25B pesticides, I think we should break that down a little bit, Erica. Um, so 25B pesticides are usually things like essential oils. Uh, those are things if, correct me if I'm wrong, but these are pesticides that don't have EPA uh, established tolerances for a pesticide residue. They're exempt from that type of uh, process because they're sort of seen as less risk. Is that about how you interpret 25B pesticides? That's my understanding, and they're also required to disclose every single ingredient in the product. Right. Allegedly, right? They're supposed to disclose. Allegedly. Right, right. So how do we deal with those as certified kind? We look first for an OMRI certification. If it's OMRI certified, I've been dealing with OMRI for 10 years. OMRI is so trustworthy with these types of certification decisions. You may not always agree with OMRI's policies and procedures, but I can tell you it really is the gold standard in the organic certification world. There are 84 certifiers in the world, 54 in the United States, and nobody does a better job at reviewing those materials than OMRI. So we, we've, we use OMRI as a resource. We use the Washington State Department of Agriculture organic uh, program as a resource. They also publish a list of pesticides, and some of those are 25B pesticides. Now the ones that aren't listed, like Guardian, for example. Guardian, boo, right? Guardian was a pesticide that was marketed as um, essential, basically essential oils. It had things like lemongrass oil in it, um, cinnamon. I, I can't remember all the ingredients. 100% natural, and they're supposed to list all the ingredients on the label. Well, it turned out that this Guardian w was discovered to have uh, been, con uh, they, were, they were actually putting in ivermectin, which is in the same... In class as abamectin, which is a great miticide. But it's, con but it's a conventional miticide that's not allowed in organic agriculture. It's certainly not allowed in a 25B pesticide. So what we do is we ask the ma materials manufacturer for verification about those ingredients in that product. And it's funny because I had a conversation with that materials manufacturer and he straight up lied to me on the phone about what was in his products. He lied to everybody. So that was a case of a bad actor kind of spoiling it for everybody. Um, and I think there's a class action lawsuit against that guy. Yeah, so um, to answer your question, we do a very thorough materials review. We, we ask the materials manufacturer for a complete list of the ingredients, including the inert ingredients. So we're talking about actives and inerts. We wanna know what the stabilizers are and what the acids are. Um, this is how I was trained to do it with Oregon Tilf. So I cannot do it any other way. Uh, so that means that we can't certify liquid fertilizers that have even the minutest amount of preservative in them, like potassium sorbate, which actually is in conventional food, not allowed in organic food. You know, that's, that's the scrutiny that um, is, is what the letter of the law is saying for what organics is. 
And um, unfortunately, we're following. I say unfortunately because it would be a lot easier to like let some of these slide, but we but we aren't. Thank you. I saw another hand back here. Right here. No. So if if I'm a farmer that does everything organic except for I've got one liquid chemical nutrient that I didn't realize I shouldn't have been using, how do I get certified kind after I stop using it? So you have to so basically the question was, if I'm uh, an organic grower, I think I'm an organic grower, and I go for the certification, in it, but I'm using one liquid fertilizer that has a component in it that's, that's prohibited, what happens? So what happens is we try and catch it on the initial review. Before we, before we charge a dime, before we come out there and do the inspection. So that's the importance and the scrutiny that we give on the initial review. What we do is you develop a farm system plan you put a materials list together. These are the fertilizers, the pesticides, et cetera. We do an evaluation of that. If one pops out that looks like it's not allowed, we have a conversation. And we'll inform you that, look, if you use this, your land's not eligible, your soil's not eligible as, with our program. It has to be free of prohibited materials for at least a year so we can call you certified kind transitional. Or 36 months, three years to, to do certified kind. So, that's, that's just the standard that, we, that we're operating with, and that's in line with organic certification. So it's just the way it goes. One more question. All right. Can you, uh, can you talk a little about the process that you go through for certifi certifying a processing lab? Sure. Yeah, so a processing facility. How do we certify a processing facility? It's a different beast than a farm, for sure. The main thing that you have to remember if you're a processor is that it's your responsibility to prevent contamination and commingling of your product, okay? So what you, what you have to do is you have to put together professional standard operating procedures to prevent that. So we need to know how you're going to clean your processing equipment. That's essential. There are some sanitizers that are allowed in organics, some a lot that aren't. So that's the first step. Um, for instance, uh, quaternary ammonia is a really uh, effective sanitizer, but it's not allowed in organics, right? Um, for processing equipment, if you're making oils, really the only one that I, so far that I think is a, a good option is certified organic alcohol. So we put you through those steps. Um, we, we ask you to present us with a product formulation. We evaluate the formulation to make sure that all the ingredients are okay. If, similar to Clean Green, if it's um, not uh, certified kind cannabis or cannabis oil, it has to be a certified organic uh, food product or food ingredient. We also allow the same processing aids that uh, certified organic processors would be able to use. So that you, you know, without the processing aids, you know your your cookies don't your brownies don't rise. Without, <laughs> so, um, let's see. What else would I tell you? Is that it's very important to be able to trace your ingredients from reception, the, the minute they they come into your the facility, all the way through the process to the final product. And so we require that type of tracking, and we verify that you have that in place. It's very important. In, like, uh, you know, in case there's a product recall, that you, can, that you can say, okay, this ingredient came from here. Here's the evidence. Let's go back there and talk to those guys about why there's a contaminant in here. And we could talk more about it later. All right. Well, that's all the time we have for questions. Let's give Andrew a big round of applause. Ha-ha. <laughs>